Last talk, I wasn't that nervous, but after that uh, amazing talk, <laughs> touching on things that I should probably learn when I'm uh, on my quest for a privacy first period tracker, I'm a little bit more nervous. <laughs> uh, but my name is uh, Benedicta and I'm from Oslo, Norway. And I'm here today to talk about um, what I learned as a run-of-the-mill developer uh, when I went on a quest to figure out how to make a pri privacy first period tracker. And it ended up being a talk about um, encryption. So I know that the uh, title is very juicy, but the talk will not be that juicy because it's going to be about encryption. Um, so <laughs> if anybody wants to leave, <laughs> you know, do that now. Um, before getting into the encryption, though, I'll tell you the story about um, how I made uh, this or why I'm making this talk and the reasoning behind it. So for me, at least, uh, I've been able to keep consumer Benedicta away from developer Benedicta for many, many years, and I've just used products like a normal, like a normal user, uh, thinking, especially when it comes to privacy, it's like I have nothing to hide, and I just like I don't have the time to like mind all of this like privacy talk. Uh, but then this winter something happened, and. Uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, developer Benedicta and consumer Benedicta had to actually sit down and have a little talk about how things are actually stored on servers around the world. Uh, my period tracker called Clue, which is a Berlin uh, company, sent me this email uh, to make sure that I didn't feel like this um, Wall Street article was about uh, their application. And they say only a few people have access to the tools we use to look into the database. And consumer Benedict or developer Benedicta, you know, always knew that data is on in a database in plain text. I mean, that's usually how we work. Um, but consumer Benedicta is kind of been like, oh, uh, <laughs> gives us as a developer that de as that developer with access could be one of my friends from university. It could be me, and it could be any of you. Uh, and I, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, and I don't really have any reason to think that Clue would be reckless with my data, uh, but I just like, oh, you know, it's, it's there. Uh, and also, I've always wanted to make a more straightforward and flexible period tracker. I've always felt that they're very invasive and very detailed, and I think maybe I found the reason why they're actually going to do something with that data. It's not uh, for my, all, all for my benefit. And I realized if I wanted to make it, I should at least figure out how I could make it without being able to spy on my user's data. So I wanted to be able to not have the possibility to be evil instead of just choosing um, not to be evil. So I did what any sane developer would do, and I created the CFP, and, I mean the talk proposal, not the CFP, and that's what got me on stage today. Uh, and also, as any sane developer uh, does, when I was procrastinating making the talk, I actually tried making the app. Uh, and <laughs> I ended up launching a very minimal MVP a couple of weeks ago, and that same day there was another report uh, that came out from uh, BuzzFeed uh, with a privacy group that figured out, again, that most of these apps sell or share your data uh, in some way. And it's making me uh, it's ha like happy to see that um, it's getting more mainstream traction, that consumer Benedicta is not allowed to just live in her, like, her little world which she doesn't care. So before we're getting into how uh, we use encryption to make privacy-first apps, I would just really like to thank Jeffrey from 1Password. Uh, it was really hard finding information on this topic in clear and concise languages and how to use encryption in a modern web-based application. And um, Jeffrey's taken a very uh, transparent, um, transparent uh, road with one password, and they have a very nice uh, white paper that I would uh, look into if you're interested after uh, listening to this talk. And I am totally a novice at this, so I've had a couple of months uh, looking into it uh, as a side project. Um, so um, most of it is based on that one password flow, but if there's any errors, it's probably on my side. And we will not go into all the like possible threat factors or how encryption works. We're going to try to figure out how to actually use it. 
So encryption, we heard a little bit uh, about, a lot of us have heard about the transport layer uh, encryption. Uh, but as a student and also later as a paid developer, uh, I've always been like, okay, encryption is just like, whoa. <laughs> That's for like, you know, the, the for people that are more geeky than me. Uh, and I'm still in awe of the people that create these encryption algorithms. And I've, I've read that it actually takes 20 years of combined education and work experience before you're allowed to make encryption algorithms on like a state security level. But it turns out that using the algorithms uh, weren't as hard as I thought. Um, but then again, handling the flow and managing the keys needed by these uh, algorithms, uh, that's a whole other story. So we'll start by looking at basic encryption. And a basic encryption algorithm takes two inputs. It takes the key and it takes the content you would like to encrypt. And we usually uh, call the, um, the content you want to encrypt for plain text, and we send it into our encryption algorithm, and out comes the cipher text. And to get it back again, we use the corresponding decryption algorithm, and we get the, um, your plain text back. And the thing that got me really in the beginning is like, what is this key? And it's always drawn as a key. And I'm like, is it the key? Like, I, there are no physical keys on the internet. Like, how does this work? Uh, and I realized in the end, like, basically, it's uh, or as its core, it's very, it's just a very long sequence of random characters. Um, there are some considerations for the different algorithms, but basically randomness is what we need. And it turns out that creating random sequences of uh, character is a really big deal um, when it comes to crypto. If the key we're using or any other kind of random secret, if it's easy to uh, guess, then the whole thing falls apart. We kind of have to trust the math behind this. And they, they have given this um, a word, and it's called entropy. If something is really hard to guess, it's got a higher entropy. If it's easy to guess, it's got a lower entropy. So what you'll see in documentation, it's like we made a very high entropy password or key. Uh, and what they just mean is it's very wrong and very random. Um, and if you're now thinking, I know how to make random stuff because I have math random in my two belt, then that is something we call uh, pseudo random values and it's not good enough when, we when we're dealing with crypto. So before showing any code examples, um, we're gonna look at the analogy that's often used and it's, uh, you can think about encryption and encryption uh, the same way as we secure our belongings in our houses. We lock them there and only somebody with the correct key can get access to our belongings. But there's like a very big difference and that is that we're not in the physical world and when we encrypt something we actually like change the form of the thing we're encrypting. While when we lock something in the house the belongings are still there, you could like see them through the uh, window, but we're still going to use this analogy in this talk because it's, uh, it's the best we have in the physical world. Um, so, what I figured out pretty quickly is that luckily web crypto is now in our browsers. Uh, we don't have to roll our own crypto and we should never roll our own crypto. Um, and it's been a w around for uh, years, I just hadn't like, caught up to it. <clears throat> So the first thing we need is the key. So we can generate the key, and this is uh, a way to do that, and we're using one of the standard algorithms. Or we want to use one of the standard algorithms, we need to generate a key for that algorithm. Uh, and we set the length to 256, uh, and it's, according to Jeffrey in one password, it's because it sounds better than 128. He says that going from 128 to 256, 56 uh, bit encryption is like going from infinity to infinity, but in marketing, if one person has 128 and another has 256, like everybody wants to go with the 256. So that's why one password changed to 256. That was their only reasoning uh, for that. Um, so we have the key, so now we need to encrypt our note. And the web crypto API is a little lower level than I am uh, as of a more full stack developer, jack of all trades. Uh, so we deal a lot with buffers and I'm not going to go into that, but that is uh, harder uh, than I, I like. Uh, so we need the, yes, in the initial diagram, we need our input, which is the note, the cipher and the plain text. And then uh, we need the key. And in addition to, um, to combat something called a chosen cipher attack, we need a different random something for every piece of data we encrypt. 
And that's to not make them like encrypt in the same way each time. Uh, but I don't like. I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> and we call this um, a variable, and in, or I call it announce because it's supposed to be different for every every piece. Um, and we set that as the IV. And this is not secret. It's just random. And you can store it with your ciphertext. So to get our notes back, we decrypt using uh, the same information, uh, the same in IV, the same key and our ciphertext and back, and we get our plain text back as a buffer, and we decode that, and we have our plain text. So that is basic encryption. We uh, take plain text into an encryption algorithm and supply it with the key. We get our ciphertext back, and we do the opposite to get our, um, get our plain text back again. So I was very pleased with myself, and I had a little prototype that did this. <laughs> uh, but then I really quickly realized that you know I was very uh, much closer to the two circles than a full owl. Um, and I will now try to uh, walk you through the steps that I felt were missing after that like initial um, um, happiness that I <laughs> felt. Um, so we'll start with just having everything on our client. Mm. And you know it's easy to we just uh, store the ciphertext notes, and we store our key. But um, if we store our key with our ciphertext notes, then um, it's not secure. Like it would be the same as just uh, saving our plain text. So and we're going to take a detour back to the house. And the scenario that we're looking at now is similar to just hiding your key somewhere close to the house. Uh, it could be under the flower pot and a secret spot under the stairs, and it's very convenient, but it's not really recommended if you have valuables in the house because anyone who finds the key can get access to your belonging. So you decide to get one of those key boxes that are pretty um, popular now with Airbnb, and you put your key in there, and you lock the key in the key box, and then you remember the code in your head. And this way, only you could still access the house, but you don't have to like, bring the key around. So back here in web app land, we do something similar. So instead of just generating a key, we import a key using our um, password-based key derivation function. <laughs> uh, so we transfer the password into a key that we could use then in an encryption algorithm. Oh, first we, oh, sorry, first we make a key from the password, and then we derive an encryption uh, key. And as you can see here, we again need something truly random because the algorithm, um, the generation, uh, the der derivation algorithm doesn't believe that a user's password is good enough. So we uh, create another uh, truly random string so that um, we make sure that this is a high entropy uh, key. And the derived key is deterministic, meaning that with the same salt and the same password, we will get the same key every time. And in our case, um, the salt will still have to be stored locally together with our encrypted data, so it doesn't add that much in terms of security right now, but at a later point, we'll see how that salt can shine. So back at the house, um, we have to, to uh, update our analogy. We have to get a key box that has uh, both a code lock and regular lock. And the next time you leave the house, you put the house key in the key box, and you lock up uh, the key box with both first your code and then with new key, and then you put that key under the flower pot. And so for someone to get into your house now, they would have to know the code of the key box and also find the key. And already we're looking at something that would make it more interesting to go over to your neighbor house where they just put the key under the flower pot. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Am I... Yeah, sorry, there was another. So with key direction, um, we create the key, uh, and then we use that for encryption, and we get our plain text, we put our plain text in our uh, decryption algorithm with our key, and then the same thing happened, and it's very, yeah, that, and now I'm sorry, <laughs> now I remember. This is how it looks like, this is our basic um, encryption, and then we have our basic encryption with key derivation. So you see it's very similar with the encryption and decryption, but we're generating the key in a different way. 
So let's move over to uh, the cloud. So of course, uh, with the period tracker, it could be a case that we would just store everything uh, encrypted and local on our user device. But as a com com uh, consumer, I've become very spoiled, and I want my backup, and I want access from multiple uh, devices. So let's uh, keep going. The only thing we need to transfer to the cloud at this point is the ciphertext. Uh, and the salt is still on our client, and the password is still uh, in our head. So everything else is in memory, uh, except for the ciphertext that we now have um, on, the, on the cloud. And this is um, where the salt actually shines, security-wise, because if I'm going to change devices, if I only had the password in my head, it would be very easy to pick up another device and use that device to access the cipher. Uh, decrypt the ciphertext that we now have on our uh, cloud server. But what we do, um, and as, as exemplified by one password here, is that we have that extra salt that they call secret key. So when I pick up a new device, I will actually, actually manually have to transfer that uh, secret key over to the new device. And this gives us a lot uh, a more added, um, um, added security. And the prob but the problem with this is that the user is not used to this kind of a flow, and 1Password is having a really hard time getting uh, users to actually, like, they want them to print this out and save it somewhere. So that if you lose a device, you could still pick up a new device and use that. Uh, and it's, um, it's something that I think users just have to get used to when we get more and more of these apps. They need to change their mental model of how, authenticate, uh, how you authenticate uh, for a service if you want privacy. And with this uh, way of doing things, we get end-to-end -end encryption um, without having to do anything. And end-to-end -end encryption was uh, just a uh, means that um, everything is, uh, uh, all keys and all encryption is happening on the client uh, so that um, nothing uh, is leaked from there. So we have that um, covered by just doing all our encryption on our client. So over the last weeks, uh, when I decided to actually try and make the app, I've been uh, talking to a lot of people about menstrual cycles. Uh, it's uh, somehow like everybody comes up to me now in parties, and that's what they want to talk about. And um, I realized one idea that I didn't initially want to share, more people um, wanted. And my idea is that I would like sometimes to selectively share some of my data, specifically for my significant others, but in other cases it could be a doctor, it could be some other cases. And I didn't say that out loud, but after like talking to people, a lot of other people uh, would like that as well. And I assist, so I'm not the only one that at some points in my cycle, I just don't want to communicate like a human, I would like the app to do it um, for me. So to be able to privately share encrypted data with others, we have to look at something called um, asynchronous uh, encryption. And in this type of encryption, we have a key pair where one key can decrypt what the other has encrypted. Um, and these two can change. Oh, not that much. <laughs> um, you can change between these um, two. You could decide to... Um, Encrypt with one and decrypt with the other, or decrypt with one and, de and then and encrypt with one and decrypt with the other. In many cases, we call these uh, a public-private key pair. Um, so for a long time, I didn't really understand that they were like interchangeables, but we usually call them a public-private key pair because the intention is that you keep one private and you never share it, and then you have one public that you can give uh, to others. And there's still it's still a possibility to flip <coughs> this around. They have two different use cases. But in this case, we're just going to look at the one where we encrypt with the public key and we decrypt with the private key. So we're going to go back to our houses and we now have a neighbor. And the neighbor, and you and your neighbor, they, you enjoy sharing your tools, but you don't really enjoy coordinating pickups and returns. So you decide that you trust her enough to give her access to your shed, but maybe not your house. And so you make sure all of the tools in, are in the shed, except maybe some fancy something that you don't want to share. And you make a copy of a key, and you drop the shed key in her lockable mailbox. So her mailbox is kind of like the public key in this instance, and then the private key is the key to the mailbox. And by doing this, you know that only somebody with the key to the mailbox would actually get access to the key to your shed. 
But then we're back at the uh, main problem in the beginning. What should she do with her ma mailbox key? She should just put it under the flower pot. No, she should put it in the key box that ha has a code and a regular lock, and then put that regular key under the flower pot. So <laughs> we're going to have a big diagram of all of this in the end. Here's the code to generate um, a key pair. And we use a different algorithm than we used um, when we generated key earlier. Um, so we take, um, we take our plain text, and we encrypt it, and we get um, the cipher text. And then we take the public key, and we, oh, sorry, no, sometimes this just goes through my head. <laughs> we take the public key and our generated key, and we encrypt that, and then we have our encrypted generated key. And we move our ciphertext and our crypto generated key over um, to the server, and the public key could be on the server, it could be anywhere, because it's public. And then to uh, decrypt, we need to use the private key of the other person, or our own, I mean, private key, to decrypt the encrypted generated key. We use that generated key to decrypt the ciphertext, and here we have our plain text. But then you might be thinking, like, well, hey, where does this private key now come from? Uh, and it's also on the server, but we have encrypted it with our derived key that we got from our password and our salt. Everybody with me? <laughs> um, these slides will be available. Um, yeah, so in the end, when we want to, so we're going to look at the decryption flow. Uh, we get our salt and our password, and we decrypt, um, we decrypt, we generate a key. I mean, we derive a key, and then we decrypt with that, and uh, we get our encrypted private key, we use our encrypted private key to um, uh, get, and we de decrypt our encrypted private key. We have our private, now we have a private key that is only in memory, then we decrypt our encrypted generated key again, we got a generated key, and then we use that to decrypt our ciphertext. And this is also um, the flow that one password uses even when you're not sharing, when you're just uh, using it for yourself, and then you use your own uh, public key to, um, um, to encrypt. And this is used a little bit just because as uh, engineers, we like to do it the same way for every case instead of having a special case when we're sharing things with only ourselves. But it also helps that uh, we could... Um, we could generate, we can we, uh, decouple some of these. So if something happens, we could make a new, um, we could make a new a derived key and then, um, and then encrypt our private key again using that. Um, if you want to change your password or those kinds of things, we can get access, we can decrypt it with our old password and then we can uh, encrypt it again with the new uh, derived key with the new password. Mm. And so it's a lot easier to go from no sharing to sharing as we encrypt a generated key with somebody else's public key. But if you're reverting it, if you want to remove access, then you have to actually take all of your data and encrypt it again, because it's hard to just, you can't um, undo giving somebody your key. So that would be like changing the lock of your um, shed. Yeah. Sorry. My slides are a little. So over to uh, authentication, which I try to kind of like skip because it's <laughs> I don't really understand it any yet. Um, when we uh, when we do authentication with encryption, it, it becomes a lot harder than we're used to because we would like the user to have the same password for both authentication and encryption. But since the password is used for encryption, it's a lot more sensitive than we what we're usually used to. So there's different ways of combating this. And one password uh, uses something called a secure remote password. And there you send over a verifier um, that's calculated from your derived key and some extra data uh, and account, um, on account creation. And then later when you authenticate, there's some very clever math on both sides that proves that you both know um, that identifier. Um, but then last password, what they do is that they take uh, that uh, derived encryption key and then they hash it and then they use that to log you in. And secure remote password um, would not work with any existing auth providers because it's a totally different system. 
And oh, one password has open sourced a Go implementation of this, a Go, yeah, uh, for a secure remote password. But I found like no, I found one node module that say they implement this, but like I don't know who made it or <laughs> how to to use that. Um, so it's a hard thing to implement uh, on your own. But I believe like the last password approach would work with the existing uh, authentication privacy we have. I cheated. Uh, as, a, as a good full stack developer, though, I found a framework that will do a lot of the heavy lifting for me. And I used a new um, framework for creating private and decentralized apps called Blockstack. And it's been working really well so far, and it, and it also has some helpers that makes the encryption a little and decryption a little less painful. You don't have to work with the buffer, buffers and that type of things. And their authentication happens on a blockchain, so very like hip words. Uh, and I haven't thoroughly look through how they do it, but they also say that their password is never uh, sent anywhere. So, to the big question, is it possible? And uh, I would say yes. <laughs> um, I've already started uh, creating POW, but as always, the challenge is who do you trust? So with POW, you have to trust that I actually do encrypt <laughs> before sending it off somewhere. And, um, but I feel like as a more of an indie developer, we have the advantage that we can choose uh, to create business models that help and not hinder privacy. If I create something where I'm not, like my business, business model is not to capitalize on people's data, uh, just like uh, one password, their business model is to secure your passwords, um, then it would be in my best interest to actually um, keep people's um, privacy. And I think also we have uh, the possibility to um, help grow the open source ecosystem so that we get better frameworks that make it easier for um, less lower level um, developers to use to create privacy first apps. And if you want to um, look at the slides or all of these diagrams, <laughs> then you can go to um, this, this uh, site on the internet. And that was all. <laughs>